Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Atiku. Um, we come from the Vision and Communications Group, and uh, we've obviously developed uh, PEC 25, uh, which is Pan African Pan African Comics, uh, with a vision to seeing uh, where this country kind of heads in the next uh, few years. Right. So, what what we've tried is basically to uh, go through uh, reconciliation and what it means um, to this country. Right. So. The question we ask ourselves is, can all that is lost be restored? Right, so what we've done is we've looked at the Day of Reconciliation. Uh, we've looked at a holiday that has been celebrated in South Africa or commemorated from 1995. Uh, what was then done was we looked at a day that was significant to both races, which is whites and blacks in the country. Uh, for different reasons, but it's very important to both. So that is why we focused on the Day of Reconciliation. Uh, we are very honored today to be hosted here at the Roman Museum, uh, which is where the Battle of Blood River actually took place. So if you can just bear with us, um, we will try and share this uh, presentation uh, so that maybe you can see what work the likes of Kamuhelo, who's, uh, Kamuhelo Mudife, who's an illustrator on my team, have done in terms of trying to bring this to life, right? So part of our objectives um, as a group is to correct the historical distortions and misrepresentations because we know that history has been told from one end. Uh, so we're trying to correct the way that it's been told. We want to initiate uh, a nationwide dialogue. We also want to create a comfortable platform uh, for people to, dis to discuss these thorny uh, topics. We want to promote the teachings of Ubuntu. We want to advocate uh, social cohesion and inclusivity. And we also want to usher in a, a renewed uh, a spirit of national pride. So we also want to inculcate a culture of uh, resolving conflicts through dialogue. So that's what uh, our objectives are. So having stud studied different eras, um, in our country's long uh, and rich history. We've placed a focus on four distinct eras, right, or epochs, or periods. The first period that we focused on is the period of Tinga and Yasenza Makona uh, up to Pambata So this will cover uh, 1828 up to 1909. We focused on the period that covers Pix Liga Isaga Seme, to Ingosu Albert Mutu, which will take from 1910 to 1960. We've also uh, focused on the formation of Mkonto Isizwe all the way to the Kodesa and this will be from 1961 to 1993. We've also covered the last one, which is what we regard as the current uh, period, which takes place from the breakthrough politically in 1994 up until the sixth administration now, which is uh, 2022, which is 28 years after uh, democracy. Right. So what we've uh, looked at here is we've identified that there are recurring themes through these periods. There are recurring themes where we've identified six of them. Uh, we're looking at tranquility. We look at uncertainty. We look at survival. We look at betrayal. We look at conflict as well as hope. Okay, so in looking at these themes, when we're talking about tranquility, what we are talking about is a harmonious existence and peaceful living, living among people. When we talk about uncertainty, we're looking at the fear of the unknown. Uh, we're looking at the doubt over things uh, that are to come and venturing into uncharted territory. So that brings about uncertainty. We've looked at survival, which is underpinned by a strong desire for self-preservation, and we've acknowledged that survival is the most primal of human instincts. Betrayal is when you reach an agreement, and only for that agreement uh, to be breached. Now, this brings about a suspicion and lack and loss of trust. Uh, people develop a win-at-all-cost mentality, where you're no longer thinking for the other party, but you're thinking for yourself. Conflict then becomes a natural progression because where betrayal is, then there's a struggle to gain the upper hand 
or dominance. The last uh, thing that we came about and we identified was hope. So this hope now is, is brought about by an unwavering uh, spirit of Ubuntu. The spirit of Ubuntu forces us, especially as Africans, not to give up on other races if they don't come to the table. So we've said we will do anything in our power to make sure that we are not only talking amongst ourselves, but we create a platform where we can reach out to the other parties so we talk around the table. So that's one of the things. Now, to see that these themes keep recurring on all the periods that we've, we've, we've said here, we said there's uh, King Tingayne Gassenza Makona all the way to Pambacha which is 1828 up to 1909. So now we see Zulu people existing in a very serene and tranquil way, where they are living comfortably. But with the arrival of the settlers from the Cape Colony, there is uncertainty now in the Amazulu Kingdom. Survival is now the reason why the Africaners left the Western Cape, to come and look for other uh, parts of the country to, to basically settle in, because it was about survival for them. They were no longer feeling welcome in the Western Cape, so they went and tried to find other places. So out of desperation, we feel that the Africana leaders will resolve to do anything in order to survive. This is the survival that we are talking about. Even if it means they must go back on the way that, and, and the agreement that they have made with uh, Dingan. This is where we see this, the story of Peter Tiff, which led to the Battle of Blood River in 1838. Right, so how history has been told in a one-sided format was that Dingan had betrayed Peter Tiff. But no one is talking about the fact that when Peter Thief came to Zululand to look for land, he went to the king and there was an agreement that uh, Peter Thief must go and recover all the cattle from uh, Sikonye. People will know Sikonye, who was a chief among the, the, the Batropa, uh, who had been uh, involved in stealing of the cattle. So the agreement is said to have said, bring everything that you find. But when Peter Diff returned with the cows, with horses, and with guns, he chose to only hand the cows to the king and keep the horses and the guns to himself. So obviously in those days, if you had these things, it meant you had an advantage if it came to war. So this is said to have angered uh, Dingan. This is started in, 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 in a conflict. So Dingan then took revenge on Peter Diff. Right. So after this conflict and dark times, we go back to hope once again, where people driven by the spirit of Ubuntu are forced to then work together and reach common ground. The next period that we talked about was the period of uh, Isaga, uh, Pigs Liga Isaga Senate, all the way to Albert II. We said we will cover 1910 up to 1960. So after the Anglo-Boer War and the Bambata Rebellion, uh, there was a period where there were no uprisings. So this is where the tranquility that we are talking about comes in. So this period is now followed closely by the formation of the Union of South Africa. So the Union of South Africa is where all the provinces which were uh, independent republics are now brought together uh, to form one country. Now there is uncertainty there because people don't know what to expect. Once again in typical Africana mode, it's all about uh, survival and the Africaners actually excluded the majority black population from anything that had to do with governing the country. So with the exclusion of black people now from government structures, so black people tried to petition the, the British monarch, because remember South Africa was still a colony. But the British monarch actually said at that time they don't want to interfere in the running of South Africa. Let South Africa run itself even though black people were not part of the government structures. So now pe black people were disenfranchised, and this now sparks a conflict. There's a conflict now. But instead of the conflict being waged in wars, there was now a new platform where this conflict was waged in the courts. You had to go and, and, and plead your case in the courts, and this period now gave a, 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 a there was a need for black people to start becoming lawyers. So that's where we see the uh, brilliant uh, legal minds, the likes of Alfred Mangena, 
fixed leader Isa Gaseme himself, Richard Nsimang, <coughs> and Charlotte Matele. So this is where all these icons uh, started emerging to try and fight this battle uh, in the courts on behalf of the majority of black people. So there's hope when this starts to happen. Up until we get the Shabville massacre, where we felt we were making progress, but with the Shabville massacre, we took 10 steps back. We then look at the third period, which covers 1961 up to 1993, which was the formation of Mkonto Wesizwe, all the way to uh, uh, Kodesa negotiations. So once again, this period sees black people being dejected now, seeming to accept this fate that was now brought about uh, by being excluded. Uh, after that period, we see in 1961, there's the establishment of, South of the Republic now of South Africa, where South Africa is cutting ties with the British monarch. And here, there's an opportunity once again that is lost, because instead of including black people, we see Africaners once again excluding black people in governing this country. Uh, we also see the introduction of stricter and more brutal laws to, to basically uh, keep black people in their place, so to speak. Um, we see now the liberation movement and the apartheid machinery being at loggerheads, where it, it leads to conflict. As we have said, that these are now the themes that we've identified. At the end of this period, towards the end of uh, the 1980s and the beginning of 1991, there is hope once again. And this hope comes when you see the unbending of uh, political parties, you see the exiles returning, you see uh, the prisoners uh, being released. Uh, you will remember 11 February 1990, those who are as old as me, when Mandela was released. There is then hope that says this country is going forward. And then there are negotiations at CODESA to try and create an environment uh, for a new South Africa uh, that includes everyone. So from that period, we now cover 1994 all the way to present day South Africa which is 21 year, 28 years uh, after uh, the freedom or liberation of the country. Uh, we see now a lot of euphoria uh, that kicks in, with people being happy that the exiles uh, are returning. We see people happy that we can now go and settle everywhere. Um, there's the drafting of the new constitution now, uh, which brings about uncertain, uncertainty. Uh, there are changes in macroeconomic uh, policies, where we, we don't know what is going to happen. There's also an opportunity now uh, that exists there in saying, as we prepare the new uh, constitution, are we then looking at clauses there that will help to bring the nation together? Now, instead of a vigorous uh, initiative to transform society, what you see is that one side is very defensive and one side is trying to reach out and say, let's not just transform this country in, on paper where we are talking about laws, but let's see it practically happening. If we're saying people are free and saying people are equal, let's look at this thing being practical and people uh, living it. Uh, you see that there's very little progress because instead of us coming together, you see people defending because they don't know what is going to happen, whether they are being threatened, uh, whether land is going to be taken away and all those uh, uh, things. So you then see protest marches, uh, you see continuous litigation now, you see stalling, and uh, you see riots that are coming because you have the majority black people saying change is not happening fast enough. You have a few uh, white people saying, hey, but we don't know if this change is going to take away our property, uh, if it's going to take away our rights, if it's going to change uh, policies and take away uh, our, our uh, industries and our businesses and so forth. So once again, we are saying we are armed with the spirit of Ubuntu. We are trying to create a culture where dialogue is used to uh, resolve conflict, which is why we are having this discussion today. We have looked at this country and we've said over the years we've had very huge moments. Uh, these moments took this country to the brink of total devastation, but also we've had very good uh, moments that have tried to bring the country together. So we've looked at a few of them. Uh, those that are as old as me, once again, will remember the Rubicon speech that was delivered by the second last apartheid president, P.W. Porter, where the whole international community was expecting P.W. Porter 
to deliver a, a speech that would set a, about in motion a process that would start freeing black people in the country. But instead, he basically backtracked and he said there must be stricter laws of apartheid and everybody was left in shock because we were expecting uh, this country to move forward, but it actually went back. We look at the Battle of Quito Carnavale, uh, which took place in Angola, and this was one of the very important battles that took place in an effort to liberate Namibia. So some people don't know that Namibia was once a colony of South Africa. So South Africa was not only uh, oppressing black people but it was in the country, but it was oppressing people in Namibia as well. So Namibia used to be part of this country up until this battle took place. Uh, this battle was very big because you had world superpowers at that time taking sides. Um, we had the Namibian independence, which was in, uh, just after Nelson Mandela was, was released. So that period where Namibia was now liberated, put pressure on the apartheid government to say, how do you liberate Namibia, which is a different country, but you're still oppressing your own people. Uh, there was the whites-only referendum where white people voted in 1992 among themselves. Remember, black people were not allowed to vote, but uh, white people then went to the vote. The vote was about one thing, whether to end apartheid or to continue with apartheid. And there were 2.8 million white people that voted at that time. That's a big, a big number. 2.8 million people voted, all white. But the majority of those white people chose to end apartheid. So that should mean a lot to us as a country. That should say there is something positive that white people have done for this country. Because they could have voted that apartheid should be continued. And what that would have done, it, was a, it would have plunged this country into more chaos as well. Because the majority of people would have continued fighting. So that was very important to see 69% of those 2.8 million white people saying that apartheid should end. So that was a step in the right direction. We also had the CODESA, which is the Convention for Democratic South Africa, where negotiations were being held to create an environment for a new South Africa that involved uh, all citizens of the country. So that was one of those moments that was seen, seen to be positive. We also identified that sport played a very important role in uniting this country. Those of us that follow cricket will all remember there was a World Cup that was held in Australia in 1992 where South Africa was participating for, for the very first time. And we saw one of the sporting icons called John T. Rhodes where he took a dive instead of throwing the ball to the stamps to take out the, 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 the batsman from Pakistan. So that picture uh, became a, an iconic picture worldwide, where South Africa coming back from reconciliation started doing things that had never been seen before uh, on the sports field. We also have our Nobel Prize uh, laureates, which we know all about, uh, people that have won the Nobel Peace Prize. You remember Albert Mutuli, uh, it was Albert Mutuli, won it in 1960. Uh, we also remember uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, the Archbishop, uh, who's very loved in this country. Uh, he also won it uh, with Nelson Mandela. Now there's history there if people are not aware. These two are the only people who lived on the same street anywhere in the world that have won the Nobel Peace Prize. So this shows that South Africa is blessed with very unique things that take place uh, in, in, in this country. And we also know that F.W. de Klerk, even though it was controversial, but he also won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, together with, uh, shared it with uh, Nelson Mandela. So these are some of the positives. There are also negatives. You will remember that in 1993, uh, Chris Hani, who was uh, then SACP Secretary General and also Chief of Staff of Umkonto Wesizwe, was shot and killed by right-wing elements in the country. Now, at that point, the country could have gone to war. But once again, people of South Africa rose uh, to the occasion and they averted that war and instead used it to move forward. Remember, this event is believed to have been a catalyst that forced the apartheid government to bring closer the, uh, the date of elections in 1994. So if it was any other country, maybe there would have been war. Remember, in the next years that followed, we saw sport again coming to play a very good role, where we saw the hosting of the Rugby World Cup in 1995, 
There was one by the South African uh, national team, which is the Springboks. You'll all remember Nelson Mandela giving the trophy to the captain, uh, Francois Pina. And the following year, there was the African Cup of Nations, uh, which was won by South Africa again. You'll remember uh, Nelson Mandela once again handing the trophy over to Neil Tovey, who was the captain. And that's, those events served to bring this country together. Now, we are also not short of iconic figures in this country. We have people that are larger than, than life, that have, throughout their existence, uh, have put themselves last and put the country first in making sure that this country moves forward. We've mentioned uh, Nelson Mandela. We've mentioned uh, Stephen Biko. There are also white people that have played this role, the likes of Bea Snodier, Bram Fisher, Trevor Huddleston, Alan Payton, and uh, Gossi Johnson. So these are patriots, uh, as I have said before, who have chose to take sides and side with vulnerable people instead of siding with powerful people. And this is the magic of this country uh, we call South Africa, which we love so much. This country has also been blessed with having inventions or world firsts, things that had never been done in other countries before that were done for the first time in South Africa. We will name but a few. Uh, we will know that South Africa was the first country that extracted uh, oil from coal. Uh, we look at the CT scan. We look at computerized ticketing systems. We've got the speed gun. Uh, we've got uh, the please call me that we use today. It was developed in South Africa. The pool cleaner, that is the creepy crawly. But in all these things that we have counted, we know that the very first human to human heart transplant in the whole world that was successful took place in South Africa at the Hroteskir Hospital in Cape Town, which was overseen by uh, Dr. Chris Bernard. There's also a very uh, uh, significant role that was played by Hamilton Nagy in assisting uh, Chris Bernard in this historic tra transplant, which is not being told. And we need to find an opportunity that will tell this story uh, in the way that it's supposed to be told, in though, even though we are not taking sides. We are not saying uh, whether it was wrong or right, but we are saying let's find a platform like this one where we tell the story uh, completely the way that it should be. So as South Africans, we should be celebrating these moments that bring us together instead of uh, 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 tearing us apart. So these are important things that we thought we would bring to the fore. And we are saying all these tributes, when they pour out, they must go to the right people. You know, uh, We must give these honors and bestow them on people that deserve them at any given time. We've also seen that on the global stage, with South Africa becoming part of the whole village now, global village, we've been able to start and, and play 